This unit is the hereditary genetics unit. And ultimately, we're going to learn about how you've inherited alleles from your parents, and that gives you different traits. But first, we're actually going to talk about how you inherited these alleles, and we're going to get into the ideas of meiosis. Now, I've already taught you about mitosis, and I did that in a different unit because mitosis and meiosis are very similar processes, and we have a tendency to confuse them. So I like to establish mitosis in a different unit before we tackle meiosis. Now, because we talked about mitosis in a previous unit, it does not mean that you're not going to have questions related to mitosis on this test. The most important thing I need you to do is to be able to differentiate between these two types of cell divisions. So you're going to have to remember some of the ideas related to mitosis in order to answer some of these questions that you're going to see. Before we get into meiosis, I want to make sure you understand what we mean by homologous chromosomes. Now let's back up a little bit because remember humans contain or human cells contain 46 chromosomes or we say that you have 23 pairs and each set or each pair are termed homologous chromosomes and we can see the pairs of homologous chromosomes in this karyotype now one of each pair is always a chromosome from mom and the other one is from dad and they're called homologous because they contain the same genes on them and here's what I mean by that if these two chromosomes are homologous, then let's say at this location, we have a gene for eye color. So that means on this chromosome that we inherited from the other parent, it would also have a gene for eye color. So all the genes on this chromosome are going to match the genes on the other chromosome if they're homologous. Now we're going to use this term quite a bit in this unit, and it's probably new, locus. The position of a gene on a chromosome is called its locus. So think of it as its location. And later on in the unit, we're going to talk about how we use letters to abbreviate the alleles that would be found at each gene, at each locus. So for example, we can say that you inherited dark eyes from one parent and a different allele, coding for a different trait related to eye color, light eyes from another parent. So we're going to use different letters to represent those two different variations for that same gene. But again, before we get too much into genetics, we're first going to talk about meiosis and the fact that meiosis allows for the passing of 23 of your chromosomes out of your 46 to your offspring. So basically, if this is your genotype, your big B, little b, when you pass on these chromosomes to the next generation, you're only going to pass on one. You're either going to pass on your big B or you're going to pass on your little b. So let's compare mitosis and meiosis before we get into some specifics of meiosis. Mitosis gave us a way to make diploid cells. Meiosis gives us the ability to create haploid cells, or cells that have the half number of chromosomes in them so that we can reproduce. Mitosis gives us a way to make new somatic cells so we can heal and grow. Meiosis gives that ability to make those reproductive cells. Remember, another term for reproductive cells are gametes, so we can call them sex cells. We're talking about sperm, egg. Another name for egg is an ovum. In mitosis, we ended up with two daughter cells, both diploid. At the end of meiosis, we're going to end up with four daughter cells. But one thing that I want to point out is that both with mitosis and meiosis, both processes start with a two end cell. Mitosis was only one division, P-M-A-T, was the four stages of mitosis. In meiosis, there's two divisions. We have meiosis one and meiosis two. Meiosis two is going to look very similar to the stages of mitosis. And each of those have prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase in them. If a cell is in meiosis one, then we say it's prophase one, metaphase one, anaphase one, and telophase one. If a cell is in meiosis two, then it's prophase two, metaphase two, anaphase two, and so on. Mitosis did not result in any genetic variation. The daughter cells looked identical to the original diploid cell, but in meiosis, we're going to get genetic variation. Those four daughter cells are not going to look identical to that original cell that started through the process of meiosis. This is because of such events in meiosis, like crossing over and independent assortment of chromosomes. We're going to talk about all of these here in a little bit. Now, I altered these diagrams down here so that you can understand the cells that go through mitosis and the cells that go through meiosis are going to experience the same phases of the cell cycle. 
So the cell will start in G1, copy its DNA in S phase, go into G2. If it's dividing by mitosis, then we have prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase, and we end up with these two daughter cells that are going to continue through the cell cycle themselves. If we have a germ cell that's going to divide by meiosis and make reproductive cells, again, it starts off in G1, copies its DNA, goes through G2, but we're going to have basically meiosis 1, prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase, and meiosis 2, prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. And then we end up with these four daughter cells, and they do not continue to go through the cell cycle. Now, I like this diagram because it puts mitosis and meiosis on the same page for comparison. And both of these diagrams show you all the stages of division, both for mitosis and meiosis. So first, let's take a look at mitosis, and let's compare it and highlight some of the differences that you need to know about meiosis. In mitosis, whenever those chromosomes line up in metaphase, you can see they're in a single file line. I like to think of it as a Congo line. Now let's compare that with what we have down here with meiosis. Here we have metaphase 1, and we can see that those chromosomes are not in a single file line. It's more like they're paired up with a partner, and I like to think of it more like they're square dancing. So that's one big difference to note, is that when chromosomes line up in metaphase and mitosis in a single file line, whereas when they line up in metaphase 1 of meiosis, they're side by side, with their homologous partner. Now another big idea to note is the fact that in prophase 1 we can see that the homologous pairs have come together. When they come together that's called synapse and this is indicated for you on the next page but I just wanted to show you what some of these different processes look like. So the homologous chromosome synapse they come together and you can see that it looks like they have kind of crossed over parts of of their chromosomes there. You can kind of see that the red has overlapped with the blue and so on. What they're attempting to show you is crossing over. Crossing over takes place in prophase 1 and this does not happen in prophase of mitosis. So this is another big difference to note about these two types of divisions. Another big difference which I've already noted is that here is the first division. So here's meiosis 1 and you can see we end up with two cells here. And then these two cells go through the second part of meiosis, which we note meiosis 2. I mentioned on the previous page that meiosis 2 looks very similar to mitosis. So let's check it out why we have these cells in the stages of meiosis. We can see here that we have prophase 2 and then metaphase 2. Remember, metaphase and mitosis, they are lined up in a single file like a Congo line, and we can see that in metaphase 2 of meiosis. Those chromosomes are lined up in a single file line at the equatorial plate, kind of like a Congo line. From there, then, the sister chromatids separate, and you can see that in this next diagram showing anaphase 2. So we no longer have X's. Another idea I wanted to point out here before we go on to the next page is when you look at the end result of any type of division, meiosis or mitosis, you're going to see that you do not have chromosomes that look like X's. So we have uncopied chromosomes at the end of these two types of divisions. So if you are drawing out a cell going through different stages of mitosis and meiosis and you end up with daughter cells and you have X's in the daughter cells, that means that you've done something wrong. On this page, I've summarized some of those points of interest that we just talked about on the previous page. So first, let's take a look at what is happening in prophase 1 with crossing over. Crossing over occurs in prophase 1 just of meiosis. This has nothing to do with mitosis. And it happens between homologous chromosomes. So remember, this is a chromosome that was from mom, and this is a chromosome that was from dad and we can see that they're exchanging parts. This does not happen between sister chromatids. I'm going to show you what it would mean if sister chromatids were crossing over. That would be these two would exchange parts, but that doesn't happen, so I'm going to erase that. So again, crossing over happens during prophase 1 of meiosis, and it's between homologous chromosomes. Now, the process of these homologous chromosomes coming together in prophase 1, I mentioned before, it's called synapsis.
So we will say synapsis is occurring. That means that the homologous pairs are finding one another in the cell. Another new term for you is where these chromosomes are actually crossing two exchange parts. This point is called the chiasma. So that chiasma is the actual site where the genetic information is being exchanged during crossing over. Whenever the homologous chromosomes have synapsed together in prophase, they form the chiasma, then they're often called a tetrad. Tetrad indicates that there's four of something. We can see that we have four chromosomes here all together, and that's why it's called a tetrad. And we mentioned that crossing over leads to genetic variation. And we want to indicate that crossing over is kind of a random event, and it doesn't have to occur the same way each time. Sometimes it occurs, sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes crossing occurs in different locations of the chromosomes. Sometimes crossing over can be happening here, and we can also have crossover of another part of the chromosome. So we can get lots of variation due to different ways that these homologous chromosomes can cross over. Again, another point of emphasis is how these chromosomes line up the first time in that first metaphase. During metaphase one of meiosis, they align side by side. So that looks like this. The homologous chromosomes are side by side. And in anaphase, we're going to see them separate. So we say the homologous chromosomes separate from one another, not the sister chromatids. In mitosis, it's the sister chromatids that separate. So we have them aligned in the middle in single file line. And anaphase is going to look like this where we've pulled apart each X, and the sister chromatids have been separated and they're moving to opposite sides of the cell. Again, big difference between mitosis and meiosis. Also, we mentioned two divisions in meiosis. Another term I want you to be familiar with that relates to meiosis is what we mean by the reduction division. At the end of meiosis one, we end up with two cells, and we've cut chromosome number in half in each of those cells. So that's why sometimes meiosis, where that first division of meiosis, is called the reduction division, because we're reducing chromosome number to half. And on the last page, I also emphasize that that second division looks really similar to mitosis. This is whenever the chromosomes line up in a single file line, and the sister chromatids are pulled apart. If you look at this diagram over here, then a lot of you maybe would have thought that that was mitosis that I'm showing you, but this is actually meiosis too. I could have also known that this was meiosis because we're ending up with four cells at the bottom. Also, you notice that crossing over has occurred, so our chromosomes are different colors there. And we also have two cells that are going through each of these stages, so this is definitely a diagram related to meiosis, not mitosis. So now that meiosis is over, we should have four cells. And let's take a look at the development of these male reproductive cells in the sperm cells. This is called spermatogenesis. And then we ha have the development of the female reproductive cells into the egg or the eggs. And this is called oogenesis, kind of a weird term. This is oogonium. This is an oocyte. This is a secondary oocyte. And then we have the official egg or the ovum. Now, a big difference to note between spermatogenesis and oogenesis is whenever the sperm cells develop, you end up with four of them. Whenever the eggs or egg develops, you only end up with one egg. You do not end up with four eggs at the end of meiosis. So we haven't been telling you the whole truth as we've been teaching you about meiosis leading to four daughter cells. As a cell divides in meiosis, like you see here, so it divides into two cells at the end of meiosis one, you can see that it looks like a larger proportion of the cytoplasm and the organelles has been distributed to one of these daughter cells. As we continue to go into meiosis two, the same thing happens. This cell continues to divide. This one actually disintegrates. It doesn't even continue to divide. It would be pointless. But again, you can see that a lot of the resources have been allocated to this one cell, and this is a much smaller cell, and again, this cell disintegrates. And so when we're left with this ovum, then we have a cell of considerable size that has a large supply of cytoplasm and proteins and organelles. Remember, ultimately, this egg, when it's fertilized by that sperm cell, which is very tiny, 
in comparison. This egg is going to become the zygote, and so that zygote needs ample supply of nutrients and cytoplasm, transcription factors, organelles, and so on, so that um, it can start to divide and grow into the organism. So as a result of unequal distribution of cytoplasm during meiosis, you inherit all of your cytoplasm, the contents of the cytoplasm, all those molecules in the cytoplasm, and all your organelles from your mom. There's no room in that sperm cell for organelles. Remember, the sperm cell is highly specialized to perform a certain task. It has to travel a long distance, so it needs a lot of energy. It has a lot of mitochondria in its tail. It has cytoskeleton so that the flagella can move. It has motor proteins, but it doesn't contain other organelles. Pretty much in the head part of the sperm fits 23 chromosomes, and that's all that there's room for. So all of the contents in this first cell comes from mom, besides 23 chromosomes supplied from dad. Now that you see how an egg develops through oogenesis, this is the perfect time to teach you about parthenogenesis, or what we mean by virgin birth. So this is reproduction from an ovum and has nothing to do with fertilization by a sperm cell. In this case, the female self-fertilizes. Now, this is a process that is normal in more simple organisms. Some invertebrates, which means they don't have a backbone, some lower plants have the ability to self-fertilize. But this is very uncommon in vertebrates. But I'm going to show you a story where every now and then it happens that we have vertebrates and the female will self-fertilize if there's no male available and she'll have offspring and they're genetically identical to her. So let's take a look at how this could happen. So this part of the diagram should look really similar to what I just showed you is that we end up with basically one ovum and then we get these other polar bodies that form. Normally, a sperm cell is going to fertilize the egg and restore that diploid number. So this is showing you basically sexual reproduction where you have sperm from the male. But let me show you what could possibly happen. Remember, the egg is haploid. And the polar body, especially that last one that formed whenever the ovum was formed, that polar body is haploid as well. If they fused, we would be back to a diploid zygote. And that's what happens. So in parthenogenesis, the ovum fuses with the haploid polar body that was produced in the female, forming a diploid zygote that will continue to divide by mitosis and develop into literally a clone of the female parent. So this is a type of asexual reproduction, but I wanted to show you to you here because we just talked about oogenesis, and I think it makes more sense since you understand how we actually only get one ovum and we get these polar bodies that form through meiosis. Let's indicate that before we go on. You have that haploid polar body fusing with that haploid egg resulting in the diploid zygote. In addition, this is a great place to talk about mitochondrial diseases because we just mentioned that all the cytoplasmic contents in that zygote came from mom. So all your organelles basically came from mom and that includes your mitochondria. Now remember the mitochondria has its own DNA and that DNA has genes on it that code for mitochondrial proteins. If you cannot make certain proteins right, mitochondrial proteins right, then you have what's called a mitochondrial disease. So if a person has a mitochondrial disease, we know that it came from mom. And what's interesting is the severity of the disease in the offspring can differ from child to child. So let's take a look at how that happens. Let's show that in this cell that's going through meiosis here, let's show some mitochondria. So let's draw four in there. And let's say two of them have alleles or genes related to a mitochondrial disease. So let's kind of put a star on those to differentiate between the two. These don't code for the mitochondrial disease. Whenever this cell divides, let's say this one gets a mitochondria that codes for the mitochondrial disease. And let's show these three going into this cell. And then let's say the cell divides again. And let's say that this mitochondria with the disease ended up in this polar body. 
and this cell inherits two mitochondria, and they're normal. They do not code for that mitochondrial disease. So if this egg is ultimately fertilized, leading to an offspring, then the child is not going to have or show symptoms of this mitochondrial disease. It simply did not inherit the mitochondria that contained those alleles for the disease. That's what this is showing you on this diagram. It just depends on the mitochondria that are packaged up into the ovum. So remember, from one cell, we're going to end up getting two polar bodies, but only one true egg or ovum, and it just depends on the mitochondria that ends up in that ovum. So we can see here that if the ovum inherits a lot of mitochondria with the alleles coding for the disease, then this child is going to have a severe form of that mitochondrial disease. Comparing to that down here, this ovum doesn't contain a lot of mitochondria coding for the disease, and so that child will show very few symptoms or will be asymptomatic, which basically means that they don't show any symptoms related to this mitochondrial disease. We've mentioned before that meiosis leads to daughter cells that show variation. They're different from the parent cell. And that leads to offspring that are different from the parents as well. So sexual reproduction leads to populations that show variation. And variation is valuable in a changing environment. Now you have to be able to tell me sources of variation in sexually reproducing populations. So the first source of variation we're going to take a look at, we've already discussed, are point mutations. We know that DNA can have changes to its base sequence, and that's what a point mutation is. It can be due to errors during replication, chemicals, virus, radiation, heat, and so on. And if mutations are arising in germ cells, then we're going to end up with eggs that might have mutation or sperm cells that have mutations. And those mutations or variations are getting inherited by the next generation. So it can lead to offspring with different traits. Now I want to point out that on rare occasions do mutations lead to good variations. Most of the time, mutations lead to developmental abnormalities, and it's not giving offspring a selective advantage. But every now and then, it does happen. Now, you should always have in your pocket an example of diseases related to different types of mutations. So a good disease to remember that is caused by a point mutation is sickle cell anemia. Remember, a change in a single base pair leads to a mutant hemoglobin protein. And whenever the red blood cells are in areas of low oxygen, they form the sickle shape, which looks like that. Normal red blood cells look like that. So again, a point mutation in a germ cell resulting in a mutation can lead to variation in the next generation. A second source of variation is crossing over during prophase one of meiosis. Again, that's when homologous chromosomes are exchanging parts. This happens different each time. It can happen in different locations. It can happen not at all. So since there's lots of variation in crossing over events, then that leads to lots of variation in those daughter cells that are formed. A third source of variation is due to segregation of chromosomes and what we mean by random independent alignment of chromosomes during metaphase one of meiosis. So let's break this down into two parts. What do we mean by segregation? And what do we mean by independent alignment of chromosomes? Well, segregation of homologous chromosomes simply means that you're only gonna pass on one of your two homologous chromosomes to those reproductive cells in meiosis. So in some reproductive cells, you're gonna pass on a big G, and in other ones, you're going to put the little g. But you're not going to pass on a big G and a little g together. So you're only going to pass on one of your two homologous chromosomes to the next generation. Your spouse is going to provide the other homologous chromosome to the next generation. But you only pass on or contribute one. So it's called segregation because ultimately we're going to separate the Gs into different locations. And we're going to separate these Ys into two different locations or two different daughter cells. Independent assortment means that when these chromosome homologous pairs are lining up, so when the Gs are lining up here, the Ys line up completely independent of how the Gs are lining up. So the chromosomes that contain the big Y are not going to always find the chromosomes with the big G and line up directly right behind them. 
they all line up independently of one another. And this is called the law of independent assortment. Now, because you have 23 pairs of chromosomes lining up independently of one another, this is how many different gametes you yourself can produce. It's 2 to the 23rd power. That is about 8.4 million different gametes that you personally can produce. So you can see that just due to segregation of homologous chromosomes and them lining up independently of one another, you can make lots of different gametes. The fourth source of variation is random fertilization of gametes. And that just means that any sperm can fuse with any ovum, and it leads to lots of combinations of chromosomes in the next generation. If you can produce 8.4 million different gametes, and your spouse can produce 8.4 million different gametes just due to the law of independent assortment, that means that you two have the possibility of creating 70 trillion different diploid combinations. That, that means basically you can produce 70 trillion different offspring. So as you can see, sexual reproduction produces variation in the next generation. Now what's interesting is this number, 70 trillion, it doesn't even factor in crossing over. The 70 trillion just can come about due to independent assortment of chromosomes by you and your spouse. So basically what this means is when you factor in crossing over as well, you will never be able to produce two zygotes that are genetically identical to one another on two different occasions from the same two people. The fifth source of variation has to do with mutations. We're going to talk about a different type of mutation. These are called chromosomal mutations, and they're different from point mutations. Point mutations were a change in a base sequence or a few base sequences. Chromosomal mutations has to do with the fact that large sections of the chromosomes can break and they can rejoin differently and sometimes incorrectly. This usually does not lead to good variations. So here are the four types of chromosomal mutations you need to be familiar with. Deletion, inversion, translocation, and duplication. So let's take a look at what is happening in each of these types of chromosomal mutations. Here we have a chromosome, and the letters are showing you the genes that should be on that chromosome. So it should contain A, B, C, D, E, F, and G, H, I. This is showing you that a part of the chromosome has broken off in the middle and that these two segments have fused together. And so this one was deleted, or this section was deleted. It's no longer there in the chromosome. So that's an example of a deletion. Let's put an A there so you remember that this one is showing a deletion. In inversion, we have the middle section, which you see right here. It is being removed, and you can tell that it's been reinserted, but it was inserted backwards. It was inverted. So that's what we mean by an inversion. So B is showing an inversion. In translocation, we have two different chromosomes, and they're not homologous to one another. So here's one chromosome, and here's an entirely different chromosome with different genes in it. And we can see that this chromosome is breaking, and we have a segment of it here, and it looks like it's joining to this chromosome. So we've translocated it. We relocated it from one chromosome to another chromosome. So C is showing you translocation. This is different from crossing over. Crossing over is whenever we swap equal parts of chromosomes between homologous chromosomes, but these two chromosomes are not homologous. And then finally, in duplication, there can be replication errors. And you can see that we have a repeat of some genes in this chromosome after it was duplicated. So D is showing you a duplication. And again, this happens due to replication mistakes. An example of a disease that originates due to duplication is Huntington's. cry du chat syndrome is due to translocation. That's when part of a chromosome number 5 breaks off and attaches onto chromosome 9. So let's find 5. You can see that this chromosome is missing a section there. And you can see right here that this chromosome has an extra section. So we had translocation of part of the chromosome.
again, have an example of different types of mutations in your pocket. So we said point mutations, remember sickle cell anemia. For chromosomal mutations, maybe remember Huntington's disease or Kreutzschatz syndrome. Kreutzschatz syndrome is called that um, because whenever an individual is born with this syndrome, when they cry, they sound like a kitten meowing. So sometimes it's referred to as cry of the cat syndrome or Kreutzschatz syndrome. The sixth source of variation is due to non-disjunction of chromosomes. And that leads to what's called aneuploidy. Anytime you have a changing chromosome number that is different from the normal by one, it's called aneuploidy. So if someone has 47 chromosomes or 45 chromosomes, we should have 46, then we say that they show aneuploidy. Now there's different types of aneuploidy. We have monosomy, mono means one, and then we have trisomy. So if someone has monosomy, then that means whenever you look at a karyotype of them, you're gonna see that instead of two chromosomes in a certain position, they only have one. So they have one instead of two homologous chromosomes. In trisomy, an organism has three of a particular chromosome instead of just two. And we see that here, and this is called trisomy 21, or it's called Down syndrome. And again, have an example of this in your pocket for the test. No one syndrome or one genetic condition that results due to non-disjunction of chromosomes. In Down syndrome, they have an extra chromosome 21. In Turner syndrome, it's a female and she only has one X chromosome instead of two, so she has 45 chromosomes instead of 46. Kleinfelter's is when you have a male and he has two X's instead of one X, so that results in 47 chromosomes. Now I want to talk about how aneuploidy arises in the next generation. Again, aneuploids or aneuploidy is caused by non-disjunction during meiosis. Non-disjunction occurs in two different events. It can occur whenever homologous chromosomes fail to separate during anaphase 1 or sister chromatids. fail to separate during anaphase 2. Both of these diagrams show both of these events. So let's take a look at this one. So on this side, we're getting a cell dividing by meiosis. We get four daughter cells here. And we're getting an error or non-disjunction here in anaphase 2. So let's go back to the beginning. So this cell will split into two cells, and it, that happened normally because each one gets an X. From there, all the X's should line up in the middle and the sister chromatids are pulled apart. And you can see that both of these sister chromatids ended up in this cell. This one divided normally, um, but this one didn't. So here's a situation where the egg or the sperm cell has an extra chromosome, and some of the eggs or sperm cells are going to be missing a chromosome. On this side over here, it's showing you non-disjunctioning happening in meiosis 1. Again, these X's are supposed to separate here into these two different cells, but the homologous chromosomes did not separate. So they both ended up in one cell, and then whenever meiosis 2 happens, then you end up with four reproductive cells. Two of them are going to have an extra chromosome, and two of them are going to be missing a chromosome. And if these cells are fertilized by the sperm cells, then you're going to have offspring that's showing aneuploidy. I'm not going to walk through the next diagram, but you can pretty much follow along like I did over here and read through that, and you should be able to understand where non-disjunction is occurring and what it leads to in those reproductive cells at the end of meiosis. Now I want to talk about polyploidy, and when we think of aneuploidy, we usually think of something that's negative because we know that it's going to lead to an organism with extra chromosomes or missing chromosomes, and that usually leads to developmental abnormalities. But polyploidy is actually a good thing in plants, or it leads to lots of variation. It leads to different species of plants. As a matter of fact, due to polyploidy, we believe that 30 to 70% of our flowering plants today originated as brand new species due to polyploidy. So let's talk about polyploidy. Remember, poly means many. If polyploidy is occurring, then that means the genome has been doubled from one generation to the next, and it's due to a failure, again, in meiosis. 
Here I have a diploid cell, a germ cell, that's going to divide by meiosis and it's going to give us reproductive cells. So when we're done, we should end up with four cells and they should have three chromosomes in them. They should be haploid. So let's take the cell through the process. We've got six chromosomes. They get replicated before division, so let's indicate that. But this is a little misleading. They should be stuck together. Like this one's going to form an X, this one's going to form an X, this will form an X, and this will form an X, and so on. So we should go from basically six individual chromosomes to six copied chromosomes. So let's show that they're attached there with the centromere. It's one thing I don't like about this diagram. Now remember, when this cell was dividing by meiosis, we should end up with three chromosomes in four different daughter cells. But we have some kind of failure here in meiosis. These cells don't divide, or they don't divide correctly. And instead of a second division happening, only one division happens. And I have a diploid cell here at the end of meiosis, and I should have a haploid cell there. Well, plants can self-fertilize, and I'm showing you this diagram over here so that you understand that a flowering plant has both the female part, so this is a female part where we make these haploid eggs, and then they have the anther, which is the male part. And if pollen, which is really plant sperm, lands here on the stigma, then it's carried down to the egg, and it fertilizes the egg. And we should be back to a zygote, which is diploid in this plant. So if the plant is making pollen or male reproductive cells and they're diploid instead of haploid and the egg that is being produced in that same plant is diploid instead of haploid, if self-fertilization occurs then the zygote, that first cell, is going to be a tetraploid. It has doubled its chromosome number. This is going to develop into a seed. The seed's going to land and germinate, and now we have a brand new plant that has a new chromosome number. Instead of six in each of its cells, it shows 12 chromosomes in each of its cells. And remember, it can self-pollinate as well. So if it makes reproductive cells that have six chromosomes in each of them, so from 12 to six, then it can self-fertilize. And then again, we have the next generation that has 12 chromosomes in it. So this is an example of polyploidy, and it can lead to speciation, especially in plants. This does not normally happen in animals. So to summarize our different sources of variation, and I have two different boxes here because I just want to note that in sexual reproduction due to meiosis, we have normal variation that arises. We have normal variation due to crossing over, independent assortment, and random fertilization of gametes. We have other variances that can arise due to abnormalities. And so those are caused by point mutations. They can lead to variations. Chromosomal mutations. That's when we're changing large sections of chromosomes. And then finally, non-disjunction. That leads to aneuploidy. On the previous pages, we've been talking about meiosis, and meiosis is necessary for organisms to sexually reproduce, but let's take a look at some asexual reproduction, and that is just reproduction from one sex, from one organism. It doesn't take two. Now, this type of reproduction does not lead to genetic variation. The offspring are genetically identical to the parents. One type of reproduction we just talked about is parthenogenesis, or that virgin birth. Here's some other types of asexual reproduction. And again, when you go into the AP exam, know one of these well. So pick binary fission or budding or fragmentation. Just make sure that you would know that it's a type of asexual reproduction and the organism that performs that type of asexual reproduction. Now, I want to point out that in some of these types of asexual reproduction, like here with budding, you can see a little bud starting to form here, and then it breaks off into an individual organism. These organisms are actually using mitosis to reproduce. So you have cell division leading to these structures that ultimately break off into an individual organism.
In fragmentation, we're going to be working with fragmentation because we're going to work with planaria. If you cut down planaria, it's a type of flatworm, into little segments, then each segment can grow into an individual planaria. And again, this is due to mitosis in this situation. Plants can asexually reproduce by runners. So they send out these runners, and when they come in contact with the ground, then they'll start to grow roots and then shoots. And so eventually, you have an individual plant that's not reliant on this parent plant. And again, these plants are going to be genetically identical to the original one. And that's the case for all of these. So this new hydra is genetically identical to this one right here. Yeast reproduced by budding. And so this yeast cell is going to be genetically identical to the parent cell. Now that we've covered the basics of meiosis and sexual reproduction, and a little bit about asexual reproduction, let's talk about the advantages and disadvantages of both. Asexually reproducing populations have the advantage in a non-changing environment. And it's simply because they can reproduce at a great rate compared to sexually reproducing organisms. It takes less time to reproduce because the offspring are usually very simple and they don't need a lot of development. And it also takes less energy. They don't have to develop certain features needed for reproduction. They don't have to show certain behaviors trying to find a mate. So it doesn't take a lot of energy for them to reproduce on their own. Also, their offspring are usually very simple and they do not need any parental care. The problem with this type of reproduction, again, is there's no genetic variation. If there is a change in the environment and they all look exactly the same, they have the same phenotype, then that phenotype can be targeted and can wipe out an entire population. So they do not survive well in a changing environment. Think of bacteria. You have bacteria on you, but whenever you walk outside, that's a change in their environment. The sunlight can kill a lot of the bacteria that's on you. So again, they're all exactly the same, and none of them have a variation that allows them to survive that change in the environment. An advantage of sexual reproduction is that the population does have genetic variation. So if there's a change in the environment, then there's probably going to be a variation in the population that is going to help some individuals survive. So the entire population is not going to be wiped out in this changing environment. So they survive better in a changing environment. But again, in a non-changing environment, they're at a disadvantage because they're outpaced by organisms that are asexually reproducing at a faster rate. Because again, for sexual reproduction, it takes more time and energy to find a mate, to produce reproductive structures, to perform behaviors and have certain traits that are attractive to the opposite sex, and also to rear offspring it takes a considerable amount of energy. So we just talked about that populations that show variations have an advantage whenever there's a change in the environment. Now, saying that asexually reproducing populations never show variation in their populations is a false statement because new traits do arise in populations that are reproducing asexually, and it's usually due to mutations, specifically point mutations. So all organisms, those reproducing sexually and asexually, can end up with new alleles, new traits, due to things like radiation that can introduce mutations, change alleles, alter alleles, chemicals, heat, replication errors. So again, all organisms, even those reproducing asexually, can end up with variations in their populations due to mutations. Bacteria also have other ways to gain variations. So they can suffer from point mutations. So that's one way they can get variation in their populations. Remember, they also can get variation due to conjugation, passing on of DNA from one cell to the other, transduction, which has to do with viruses, viruses introducing new genes. So here we have a gene here bacterial gene and now it's getting incorporated into this bacteria cell so again we just introduced a variation into that population and also through transformation when they pick up extracellular pieces of DNA so it's important that you can tell me how variation 
develops in sexually reproducing populations due to events in meiosis like crossing over and independent assortment and segregation of alleles. But it's also important that you can identify how asexually reproducing populations also can get variations through things like point mutations. Now, as we're finishing up this lecture about meiosis and the passing on of your alleles to the next generation, there is this idea that I want to bring up because it's, it's fairly new, but I feel like it's very fascinating. And it is important that you understand that some of the choices you make in your life during this time of your life, especially before you have children, it's affecting your DNA. And this DNA is getting passed on to your children. So we just talked about how your parents with different alleles are going to pass on one of them to the next generation. You get one from mom and you get one from dad. And we used to think that these epigenetic tags, these methyl groups that get attached to the DNA of the chromosomes, gets completely erased and you start from scratch whenever you inherit these alleles from your parents. But now we know that some epigenetic tags remain in place as you pass that chromosome down to your offspring. And this is what we mean by epigenetic inheritance. So this means that your experiences, these tags that you're picking up right now due to the environment and your diet and so on, that these tags can be passed down to your future generations. And if you had the evolution unit in pre-AP, and we talked about the ideas of Lamarck, and we talked about the ideas of Darwin. Darwin's idea was natural selection, and that's the most accepted theory to how populations evolve over time. Um, we had Lamarck, and he had this idea of acquired characteristics, and he thought that parents or organisms could acquire characteristics in their lifetime, and they could pass on those traits to the next generation. And we eventually thought we disproved Lamarck's idea of the theory of acquired characteristics because we knew that, that if you, for example, let's say that you spent a lot of time in the sun and so you developed a dark tan, we knew that your children wouldn't come out with a darker skin color. So we kind of discarded his theories here, but now we're finding that his ideas weren't quite off base. And we know that what you're doing in your lifetime now is affecting the structure of your DNA in the form of these epigenetic tags, these methyl groups. And you're passing on these methyl groups, this methylated DNA or unmethylated DNA, to the next generation. So um, just keep in mind that you know healthy lifestyles could be leading to healthier children because of the tags that you're passing on or not passing on in your DNA.